Hello and welcome to my review of Legion of the Damned by Sven Hassel. Originally published in 1953, Legion of the Damned follows the wartime experiences of Hassel as he served in the German army during the invasion of Russia. Sven Hassel is the pen name of a Danish writer whose name I won't try to pronounce. And there is a degree of controversy around whether he served in the German army at all and even that he might have perhaps employed a ghostwriter or plagiarised his work. Those accusations started in the 1960s, and up to then, the book was very popular in Europe, particularly in the UK. The plot of Legion of the Damned follows Hassel and his comrades during the invasion of Russia and details some of the atrocities of that ferocious campaign. Initially part of a tank crew with Porter and the Olden, the three remain close friends as the numbers of their 6,000-strong battalion rapidly drop. At the last point he offers a count, Hassel suggests that of those 6,000, only seven remain. While chronologically recounted, Hassel tale told from a first-person perspective is presented as a series of short chapters read like anecdotes um, that recount a horrific or occasionally bizarre or humorous incident often though the events of one chapter have very little bearing on the one before or the one after and the net result is a highly fragmented look at the life of Hassel and at war generally. Hassel pulls few punches, and while I'm obviously working with a translation here, often the chapters hit the right notes, drawing the reader in despite the jarring pace. Her jarring is accentuated when the chapter skips out of the blood and guts of the front to a moment of tranquility or normalcy during the rare periods of leave that Hassel is permitted. This is, I assume, uh, deliberate attempting to show how the soldier himself struggles with that transition but in 1953 the treatment of that difficult switch from war to peace is not truly explored in any meaningful way. Further it detracts somewhat from the impact of the relationships Hassel forms with a smattering of women that he meets. The book's opening for example with Eva heroically getting herself sent to a concentration camp in order to save Hassel's life is not really served by barely getting a second mention. Indeed, the next time we see Hassel out of the army, he's forgotten her completely and transferred his affections to Ursula. When she is later killed, his grief, though powerfully portrayed, lasts just a page, and it isn't long before he's in a relationship with a nurse he meets while recovering from wounds suffered at the front. The most powerful encounter that Hassel and co. have with women in the book is, however, adeptly handled. The soldiers are waiting at a railway siding and Porter, the company comedian, announces that there will be a crowd of lovely ladies waiting outside the train for them. When they open the door, he was as taken aback as the rest of us, for there in actual fact were three young women. Hassel offers some poetics on the sanctity and beauty of the other sex, their exalted position as the representatives of the soldier's humanity. To the soldier, a woman is a remarkable, complicated being. She is a romantic, remote and lofty goal for the aching, unsatisfied longings conjured up in lonely dreams of a lost, normal civilian existence. There is a duality here with the same girl serving as the target for the company of soldiers' accumulated and vocalised salacity, and only after a page of commentary does Hassel notice that the girls are the other side of a fence to a concentration camp. Most of the action is portrayed as bitter and gritty. The Germans particularly seem to be fighting purely for self-preservation, with Hassel insisting that fear is more important than bravery. They hate their commanders, and particularly the Nazis and the SS, far more than they do the Red Army. Against this backdrop, their encounter with the girls is probably their most heroic action. Endangering themselves, they rescue the three girls and then arrange some transport to France. The reward for this heroism, fairly typical of the darkness of Hassel's book, is that one of the heroic saviours is then shot in the back by a French partisan. This is very much that type of retelling of the war. Because Hassel had deserted during the German invasion of Poland and then been recaptured, he is assigned to a penal battalion, and his superiors consider them not just expendable, but often seem to consider it their goal to actually have them exterminated. The bitterness, then, is quite understandable. The hatred of the Nazis, while completely plausible in the latter stages of the book when the war is clearly being lost. I, I found it interesting as well that it was so developed even in the early stages when things were going quite well. Hassel claims to have joined the German army in 1936, which is three years after Hitler came to power, and Hitler's views on other nations and living space for Germans were not a secret even then. It seems strange to have joined something he was so opposed to, especially given that as a Dane, joining the German army would have been quite a task in itself. However, Hassel details 
his fraught and dangerous life in the penal battalion with a hearty cynical wit. He describes an unexploded torpedo he is trying to disarm as a cold-blooded opponent and considers the reward of three cigarettes as payment for his success good business because he had only expected one. Much of the levity of the text is injected by Porter, a man we are told both the devil and God want nothing to do with in case he makes them look foolish. Porter knows somebody everywhere and is able to conjure up mischief and witticisms from the air. After scamming five bottles of wine from a Nazi train attendant, he considers the bottles being shot before they've been properly emptied a greater tragedy than being shot himself. And in one memorable passage, he returns from being missing in action for a week with six bottles of vodka and a commissar's briefcase to carry them in, presumably the spoils of gambling rather than the spoils of war. Dichotomous to Porter's wild exploits is the regular insistence that war is as pointless as it is horrific and that it is led by incompetence, with Hassel offering this equation early on in proceedings. If war equals muddle, and muddle equals no responsibility, then war equals no responsibility. This then is the rationale for the abysmal behaviour of those involved. The commanders determined to exterminate their own men, senselessly happy to brutalise them or work them to death for their past misdemeanours, happy to allocate them the most dangerous roles over and over again and then berate them for their anger and cynicism. Little wonder that Hassel muses, I do not believe in the lyric poets of war. Nobody will persuade me that war is a dashing, exciting adventure for he-men. Accepting his own literary limitations, he goes on to recount the slaughter that makes up one battle in a series of cold-blooded snippets, each brutally punctuated with the epitaph, so that is that, in a way that is certainly reminiscent of Kurt Vonnegut's anti-war book Slaughterhouse Five as does the occasional anecdote that borders on the wacky. For example, the German army, after suffering horrendous losses, is sending young boys to the front. Some of these, captured by the Russians, are returned with their trousers cut to resemble shorts, and a note pinned to their back that says, the Red Army does not fight against children. Return these to their mothers so they can finish being suckled. And one elderly soldier who is denied leave by the Germans after all his family has been killed is captured by the Soviets and then returned to the Germans with his leave granted by the Russians commanding officer. This whole section, including the part where the two sides engage in a phony war to please their commanders while trading and socialising each with each other when they're not present, is actually quite affecting because it shows the humanity of these people. Very similar young men, perfectly capable of associating and even being friendly without the intervention of supposed superiors. It's very strong, despite Hassel's early resistance that he isn't much of a writer, as is a later scene where there's a sudden shift from the past tense which Hassel had employed to them, and he then describes himself in the present tense and many of his lost comrades in the past. As I tighten my chin strap and sit on my helmet, I let my gaze travel along the company whose commander I am. In the space right in front of me once stood Sergeant Edel. He died of typhoid in 1943. Behind him once stood tall, good-natured Sergeant Bielendorf, buried alive with the whole of No. 4 platoon during the fighting at the Kuban bridgehead. Hugo Stieg, under-officer, burned in his tank with his side ripped open by a shell splinter. Asmus Brown, the ever-cheerful, both legs and one arm torn off in February 1942. And it carries on in much the same tone. Of course, working with the translation, it's impossible for me to say how much of that is down to Hassel and how much of that is down to his translator, Morris Michael, especially as I don't know how Danes conjugate their verbs, if at all. Not everything is perfect. Hassel describes action scenes as a hurricane, perhaps once or twice too often, and as in the examples above, the translator hasn't translated the German military ranks at all, which makes the chain of command something a layman like myself has to take a poorly educated guess at. That, along with a handful of other times, where for no good reason certain words haven't been translated or offered an explanatory footnote at all, is a somewhat strange choice. In conclusion, this is a very solid and engrossing book that provides a series of snapshots about the war from the perhaps a touch neglected perspective of the Germans. Hassel writes well enough and his cast of characters, though somewhat familiar to people who've read books and watched movies in this genre with any regularity, is still strong enough and engaging enough. The heroism of rescuing the girls from the concentration camp and the sadism of their commanders certainly helps sell them as protagonists to like and respect, as does the unflinching honesty in the moments where their own behaviour slips below their own standards. It's a grisly and cold-blooded depiction of a slaughter, clearly sung from the same hymn book as two other excellent war books I've read lately, 
a short time as by Gustav Hasford and Slaughterhouse Five, as mentioned by Kurt Vonnegut. I'd recommend both of those before this, but if you're interested in war or in war books generally, then there is virtually nothing about this book which would make me think it wouldn't be a sound investment of your time and money. Recommended. So thanks for watching. It'd give me a rush of dopamine if you could click like, subscribe, ring the bell, and perhaps watch some more videos while you're here. If not, oh well, at least I won't get addicted to the stuff. Thanks for watching and goodbye.